having said that, I want to welcome you back to a new year. Still have the same Jewish journey, still walking the same road, but it's one that's well worth walking together. This Jewish journey through the Gospel of John. So now just to hit the highlights, reinforce yet again what we covered thus far last week was Jesus celebrating Hanukkah in the temple and a very special pointed message relating to the festival of Hanukkah in the temple in Jerusalem. Uh, and we saw, of course, uh, the process as John has taken us from chapter 8 through chapter 10, uh, how to illuminate the Festival of Tabernacles and take us all the way through Hanukkah. How does he connect them together? Yeshua's statement, discourse, I am the light of the world, followed immediately thereafter by healing a man uh, who was born blind, congenitally blindness, uh, and leading us, of course, to the Festival of Lights and this fabulous revelation that he and the Father are one. We have seen thus far, we have seen four I am's with the predicate. We've seen one I am without a predicate. That was one of the opportunities at the end of chapter 8 for the Jewish people to want to stone him. But we have seen four I am's with a predicate. We'll see another one uh, shortly. We've seen I am the bread of life, I am the light of the world, I am the, uh, the gate or the door, and I am the good shepherd. We have seen a theology of salvation revealed in chapter 10, dealing with human responsibility. My sheep hear my voice, they follow me. So yes, we must make a decision uh, for Jesus. We have seen also divine election, the other side of the coin. We've seen man's responsibility, now we see God's responsibility. And frankly, quite honestly, uh, the divine election aspect of the theology is a little bit stronger in John uh, than the human responsibility. Both are present, however. And we see, I will give eternal life to uh, them, and they will never perish, and my Father who has given them to me is greater than all. So divine election, which at least balances out human responsibility, if not more. But more important than both human responsibility and divine election is the concept of eternal security. Uh, no one will snatch them, my followers, in other words, out of my hand, Furthermore, no one is able to snatch them, my followers, out of the Father's hand. Yeshua has the authority to both save and secure his disciples. And, of course, the big giant matzo ball lobbed out there to the crowd that day. I and the Father are one. And the day that the Phony baloney Antiochus Epiphanes, this manifest God, this uh, counterfeit, this uh, imposter, uh, and the defeat over this uh, ridiculous uh, figure is celebrated. Yeshua says, there is one who actually is the manifestation of God. It's me. The Jews answered, for a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy. And this was the understanding the Jewish people had. And this is a, an understanding some people have as well. And it, it's a misunderstanding. It was a misunderstanding 2,000 years ago. It's a misunderstanding today. You being a man, make yourself out to be God. That is not what the New Testament teaches. That is not what Yeshua claimed. Nobody is ever claiming within the New Testament that Jesus, a man, makes himself out to be God. No. The gospel is simply this, that God has become a man. For a purpose, to complete his purposes, God has manifested himself in human flesh, not the other way around. The other way around is a heresy. The reverse is what John is teaching. God became man. Again, the Gospel of John is predicated on a structure of Jewish festivals. We've seen from chapter 2 all the way through chapter 10. Uh, each chapter reveals a different or focuses in on a different uh, Jewish holiday festival or Shabbat, and each one of those is thematically related to a teaching or a miracle or both that Yeshua does. Now we get to chapter 11. You will notice chapter 11 is not related. It's the only one that we see thus far that is not related 
to a Jewish festival. It stands alone. It is a hinge. It's the hinge of the book. And in fact, after chapter 11, it is only a final Passover. That is the only other fe feast, the other, only other Jewish holiday, holy day, that uh, uh, undergirds the rest of the narrative, the entire remainder from, 20, uh, from 12 to 21, uh, the narrative of John. So 11 stands alone, should pay attention to it. It's a hinge, and it actually is the longest story. And John, John's a book full of stories and interactions, and this one is the longest continually running story in the Gospel of John. And there's a reason, because it is chapter 11, which, by the way, for those of you who haven't read ahead, is going to be the raising of Lazarus from the dead. It is this that that precipitates the final decision of the Jewish people to stop attempting to stone Jesus, to stop attempting to execute Jesus and actually carry through with the plan. Why is that? We'll see as the story unfolds. We will see that it is both Hanukkah the healing of the blind man, all that has come before in the previous chapters, and this chapter, that together fulfill what was declared in the opening verses of the gospel, in the prologue. In him was life, and the light, the life was the light of all people. We've seen the light. Chapter 11, we'll see the life. Well, here's the new material. End of chapter 10, palate cleanser. And he went away again beyond the Jordan to the place where John was first baptizing. And he was staying there. You remember how the gospel opens after the prologue, after the first 18 verses, we get to the actual narrative material. And we begin with John, we begin with baptizing beyond the Jordan. This is a return, if we will, back to the future. We have a, 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 a circle. And uh, uh, just as John began, the story of John, in a sense, begins post-baptism with a wedding, uh, we'll see in chapter 11 a funeral. Both are preceded, both the wedding and the funeral, are preceded by returning to the area of John first baptizing. And Jesus was staying there in this basic location. There's a couple of different arguments as to where specifically this is. Uh, this is one of the uh, locations, the traditional location of where this area was, but there are other ideas we don't need to go into. Many, wherever it was that they, they went beyond the Jordan, which is to the east of the Jordan, many came to him and were saying, well, John, that's John the Baptist, not John the author of the gospel, the disciple of Jesus. Well, while John, the Baptist, performed no sign, yet everything John said about this man was true. Oh my goodness, well it has been 10 chapters since we saw what John said about this man uh, in several months. I'm wondering if there's anybody here who remembers anything that John said about this man. Anyone? What did John say about this Messiah? Lamb of God takes away the sin of the world. That was good. That's an easy one. Low-hanging fruit, my friend. All right. Anyone else? Well, it's okay. Don't worry about it. I have a nice handy chart for you. Um, what, John, what John proclaimed, John's testimony of Yeshua, uh, if you remember this chart from way back when, uh, is that the Messiah would be unrecognized. He has a superior status to John. He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This, uh, this room is... Uh, unbalanced. There's far more people on this side than on this side. Um, I feel like if I'm not careful, the room might start to list <laughs> this way. Uh, Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, on whom the Holy, he's the one on whom the Holy Spirit not just comes but remains. Uh, this individual baptizes with the Holy Spirit and he is the Son of God. So these are the six uh, points of testimony that John gave about Yeshua way back in chapter 1. Um, and uh, everything John said about this man, which you now see, six things, was true, and many believed in him there. 
As I said, palate cleanser, a little piece of connection um, to mark the time between Hanukkah and uh, pre-Passover. Verse 1. Now a certain man was sick. Lazarus, in Hebrew, Eliezer, God helps. Lazarus of Bethany, Bethania, the village of Mary, and her sister Martha. Mary and her sister Martha, no indication of what his relationship is to Mary and her sister Martha at this point. Let's read on and see if anything gets clearer. It was the Mary, oh, he's going to tell you, first of all, apparently more important than Lazarus is right now is that you understand which Mary, which Martha we're talking about. This is the Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped the feet with her hair, which is actually a story John hasn't told yet. That's coming in the next chapter, indicating to us that John, when he wrote the gospel, is depending on uh, this story being so familiar of Mary uh, uh, anointing Jesus' uh, feet and wiping with her hair that uh, it's uh, common and out there in the culture that people already know the story. It's a common story, and he wants to let them know before he actually even tells the story. Uh, but this is the Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with his hair. And her brother, Lazarus, so, okay, we know that Mary and Martha are sisters, and Mary is Lazarus' sister, his brother. So, okay, so we've got three siblings, his brother. But the point being, of the three siblings, one is sick. Lazarus is sick. Eliezer is sick. So the sisters sent word to him, to Yeshua. Not to Lazarus, he already knew he was sick. Uh, the sisters sent word to Yeshua saying, Lord, not Lord as in uh, the Lord God of uh, the universe. Sir, Formal term. Behold, heads up, pay attention. He whom you love is sick. He whom you love. We haven't met this guy yet. We haven't met the family yet in the story. Isn't it, I find it always interesting what the Gospels tell us and what the Gospels leave out. How many relationships does Yeshua have that the Gospels barely hint at, or even don't even matter. How many relationships don't we know? How, how does this guy is so deep in with this family and with Lazarus that he is so close with them that she can say, he whom you love is sick? John didn't share this with us. All he shares is that, listen, yeah, Jesus, guess what? Jesus has a life outside of 21 chapters of this gospel, get over it, right? He's a real man, had a real life, had real relationships, and you can't squeeze them all in. It's not a biography. It's selected theological biography. That's what a gospel is. So I, I just wonder, well, what, how did they get to know one another, and what's the, what's the backstory behind the relationship and the closeness of Lazarus, Eliezer, and Yeshua? Don't know. Won't find out until we see them both in heaven. But nonetheless, behold, he whom you love is sick. But when Jesus heard this, he said, remember where Jesus is. Jesus is uh, at minimum, at minimum, he's a day out and probably more. Okay, Out beyond the, on the other side of the Jordan, on where we call modern day Jordan, so, uh, somewhere out there. When Yeshua heard this, he said, the sickness is not unto death. It's not to end in death. The end of this sickness, rather, is for the glory of God. And when I say for the glory of God, what I mean is so that the Son of God, who is that? The one John testified, Messiah, Yeshua. So that the Son of God may be glorified by it. So the glory of God is reflected in the Son of God being glorified. So this sickness of Lazarus, of Eliezer, is going to end in the glorification 
of the Son of God. Now, the interesting thing about how John uses, and we've talked about this thus far, but we're going to actually talk a little bit more in future months uh, as we get into more text, deeper into the text. When Jesus speaks of the Son of God being glorified, it always has to do with his own death and resurrection and ascension to the right hand of God. There's, it's not like, hey, I'm going to receive accolades because of Lazarus being sick. That's not the glorification that Yeshua is referring to. That's not how it's used in John. Son of man's glorification always is death, resurrection, ascension. That's the glorification. So somehow, the sickness of Lazarus is going to lead to the death resurrection and ascension of Yeshua. Remember, we talked about chapter 11 being the pivot point in the gospel, and it is the, the final straw that breaks the Jewish leadership's camel's back uh, where they finally decide that they, are going, they, they cannot let this stand. They are going to have to take matters into their hands and, uh, and not just half-hearted attempts to stone him, but they're going to actually have to make a real plan. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister, who's not mentioned here. Well, she's already been mentioned. Martha's likely the older one, and you don't know if you mention the older one, and then she's got a sister. We all know the younger one's Mary. And Lazarus. He loved them. He loved them. So, when he heard that he, Lazarus, was sick, he rushed right over. no. He didn't. He called 911. He sent the ambulance. No. Because he loved Martha and Mary and Lazarus, because he loved them, when he heard Lazarus was sick, he didn't move. He stayed right where he was. How heartless, how unfeeling. Why didn't he run right over? If he really loved them, he would run right over. We've seen he's a great miracle worker. Why didn't he just run there and, and heal him? We've seen him before. We've seen Jesus heal a congenitally blind man. He stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Why did he do that? Again, see the connection John is drawing he loved Martha and Mary and Lazarus. That's why he stayed two extra days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he says to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. This is where Mary and Martha are there in Bethany, in Judea right outside of Jerusalem. Let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, you know, you found out he was sick and you stayed where he was and now you want to go? Uh, as a matter of fact, let me remind you, Rabbi, let us remind you, Rabbi, teacher, authority figure in our lives. I don't know if you remember, but uh, the Jewish leadership was just now seeking to stone you on Hanukkah, and are you going to go there again? Are you going to put yourself in harm's way? Are you going to risk it? And by you risking it, risking us as well? Are you going to go there again? They're going to kill you. Yeshua answered, are there not 12 hours in a day? To which the makers of Timex would have said, no, there's 24 hours by our watch. Um, there's 12 hours uh, in the ancient world, Roman world, uh, uh, Jewish world. Um, they divided the, uh, the day into night and, uh, and the day and uh, the daylight. And again, it was flexible depending on what season. But the daylight was divided into 12 segments, hours, and the nighttime, 12 hours. So not exactly hours, like 60-minute hours, but 12 segments. Are, are there not 12 hours in a day? And of course, there are in that world. If anyone walks in the day, 
He does not stumble. Now, this seems like so obvious. What are you, what are you trying to, if you walk in the day, you don't stumble, unless you're a really big klutz, uh, and then all bets are off. But nor, a normal person, he walks in the day, he doesn't stumble. And here's why he doesn't stumble. Because he sees the light of this world. It's a double entendre, right? The sun is the light of this world. He's got plenty of light. He can walk. But Jesus has spent chapter 8 and chapter 9 teaching that he is the light of the world. And so he's going further than saying, oh, well, if you're walking the day, you're going to be okay. At nighttime, make sure you take a flashlight. It's a little bit treacherous. No. He's saying, I am the light of the world, and I have to do what I have to do while I'm able, while it's day, because night is coming. And then this component of the ministry is complete. That's coming. It's a little foretaste. So Yeshua, I love this, because he doesn't stumble because he sees the light of this world. We see Yeshua, he is the light of the world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles. How come? Because the light is not shining around him? No, this is where we know how Jesus is going. Because the light is not in him. And we have, again, we have this theme. We've seen it through John. Every now and then it, it's kind of subtle. Some people think it's not that subtle. I think it's pretty subtle. Um, this contrast between light and darkness, day and night. Uh, and here we have a great example of Yeshua speaking not of day and night as uh, 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 the obvious tangible concepts, but of theological uh, constructs. Light, those who are related to me, and night. If the light is in you, you can walk and have confidence. If the light is not in you, you are truly lost. What is the default position regarding the world? It is darkness. Right? The light shines in the darkness. The darkness does not overtake it. The light, darkness cannot comprehend it. Then he said, and after this he said, brother, and after that he said to them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep. But I go so that I may awaken him out of sleep. To which the disciples said, why do you need to go all the way, schlep all the way down to Bethany to wake him out of sleep? Don't they have alarm clocks there? Can he wake himself up with, a, with an alarm clock? And again, we have one of the great examples of misunderstood words. Jesus teaches in a metaphorical sense, and his words are understood in a literal sense. That is a running theme, the irony of seeing Jesus' words misunderstood and taking literally when, no, he's speaking metaphorically. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he'll recover. This is good. Sleep is good medicine. But Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought that he was speaking of literal sleep. A good nap. Lazarus at this point is undergoing a lot more than just a good nap. So Jesus then said to them, all right, let me talk to you straight up here. I know you're still a little slow sometimes and maybe it's early in the morning. But Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. But that's not a period. Lazarus is dead. And I am glad that Lazarus is dead. I am glad. What is Jesus glad about? I am, I rejoice, what it says. I am glad, I rejoice for your sakes that I was not there so that you may believe. I'm glad Lazarus is dead for you because what I'm about to do when I go, when we go together to Bethany, will strengthen your faith. And believe me, your faith is going to need all the extra fortification it can stand 
because of what is going to follow after chapter 11. I'm glad I wasn't there so that you may believe, but enough talk. Let's go up to him. Therefore Thomas called Didymus the twin. We see Thomas in this gospel a couple of times. Said to his fellow disciples, let us go also that we may die with him. Which I say, what a Debbie Downer. Let's get, it's always great to have somebody in your group like this. Let's, okay, you know, every group's got to have an Eeyore. You know, let's go to that we may die with him. Or maybe it's false bravado or, oh, we don't know. But uh, th th things are not, let's just say that the disciples are not looking optimistically to what is going to transpire. And Jesus, meanwhile, is, is glad that somebody's dead. These guys, they're going to a funeral. It, it's their own, okay? Uh, it's their own funeral they're going to in their minds. So when Jesus came, he found that he, that's Lazarus, had already been in the tomb four days. Now that's a telling statement. Now in our culture, not so telling, but in Jewish culture, absolutely, it's a, it's a marker that indicates beyond four days, there's no hope of any kind of resuscitation. The rabbis taught that, well, you know, within the first three days after death, there's always the possibility that the spirit, the spirit just kind of hovers, hoping to re-enter the body. Uh, but after the third day, um, the, that's it. Goes uh, to, into the presence of God, and there's no, there's no uh, hope for the body. There's no hope of healing, resurrection, resuscitation, nothing. So the fact that Lazarus has already been in the tomb for four days indicates that if anybody had the power, any hope that there was going to be a resuscitation or a miraculous healing, anything like this, you're a day late and more than a dollar short on this one. A couple of shekels short on this. It's too late. His spirit has already departed. It's just dead, decaying flesh in the tomb. So when Jesus came, he'd already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off. How many of you were with me on our Israel trip? How many of you have been to Israel? Okay, you know exactly where Jerusalem is. So you know, if you go two miles on the other side of the, uh, on the, other side of, uh, the Mount of Olives, off on the, uh, on the far site, you see the Mount of Olives. And you can see... Um, there's a little tower. I don't know if you can see this little tower on the far left, and behind that is Bethany. This is approaching from Jericho. Let's get a little closer. You see in the bottom right, this is one of those magnified pictures uh, that gives you a perspective. Um, you're looking at Bethany on the bottom right corner. You're looking at Jerusalem on the upper right corner. You can see the, uh, you can see the city of Jerusalem. And you see separating them is simply the Kidron Valley, Mount of Olives. On the other side of the Mount of Olives is Bethany. Here's a closer up view of Bethany for us. And Bethany, uh, at the turn of the previous century, you can see it's no way was the bustling metropolis it is now. Um, and another photo of what it was uh, in 19, this is 1934. So this is uh, 14 years before Israel became a state. This is what this little village, oh little town of Bethany, how, how small it was, how large it is now. Well, anyway, this is what modern-day Bethany looks like. It's one of the churches, actually two of the churches. And, of course, you can visit the famous Lazarus Bazaar because, you know what, someone's always ready to make a buck in the Holy Land, um, trading on the Bible, so we can go to the Bazaar of Lazarus right down the road, right down the street from his tomb. It's very convenient, literally one-stop shopping. You can visit and then you can purchase. Okay. And many of the Jews, many of the Jewish leadership, many of the Jewish people, many of the Jewish neighbors had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. There's a period of time Jewish people mourn. It's a seven-day period of time. It's called sitting shiva. 
Uh, it's a period of mourning. Jewish people still do this today. And it is a time when relatives and neighbors and uh, apparently Lazarus and Mary and Martha were uh, quite influential. They kind of well off. Uh, and uh, so they had a lot of people coming to console them from far off, even from Jerusalem. Uh, and in fact, in the Mishnah, Ketubot 4.4, uh, Rabbi Judah says, even the poorest man in Israel must provide no less than two flutes and one lamenting woman. So funerals were big deal. Even if you were poor, you had a, uh, a period of mourning uh, and uh, you hired some professionals to come and uh, do the job as well. So Martha, therefore, when she heard that Jesus was coming, she does something that's interesting. She, she breaks protocol. She breaks the custom of mourning. And instead of staying in the home and waiting for visitors to come to her, she somehow hears whether Jesus sent a, a messenger ahead or whether she had been looking and, and, and had somebody posted to look. When she heard that Yeshua was coming, she went to meet him. So she leaves the house of mourning and goes up the road to meet him. But Mary stayed at the house, and that, of course, sounds just like the Mary and Martha that we saw in the Gospel of Luke. All right, Luke 10, 38 40 through 40. Now as they went on the way, Jesus entered a certain village. A woman named Martha welcomed him to her home. She had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet, listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks, so she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. Uh, Martha is the woman of action. She's got the personality that is uh, always doing, and she rushes out to see Yeshua. And she says to Jesus, Sir, Lord, not Lord God, Sir, Kiri, Greek, Adon, Hebrew, if you had been here, because you're a miracle worker, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. Is that a statement of faith? Is that a slight rebuke? What took you so long? I sent you word he was sick. You tarried. Now he's dead. You missed a real whopping opportunity to heal somebody that you love. I leave that ambiguity to you to decide what's in between the text. My brother would not have died. Even now, I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. And again, is that simply a statement? Yeah, I still believe in you, even though you weren't here. You didn't come through for us, but I know that you're still a man of God. You're still the Messiah. You're still, <coughs> you're still someone worthy of, of trusting. Or... Is she saying, even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you, even though no one's ever heard of anybody being resuscitated or making a miraculous recovery after being dead for four days. It's not even in the rabbinical imagination that such a thing is possible. So what's the subtext? just gives us the text. So provide your own subtext. I'll leave the ambiguity stand there. Yeshua said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha, as a good Jewish woman, said, I know he will rise again. Yeah, of course he'll rise again. In the resurrection, on the last day, as Jewish theology. Uh, as 1 Samuel says, the Lord kills and makes alive. He brings down to Sheol. He raises up. Jewish people believe in the resurrection. Ezekiel 37, 13. And you will know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O oh, my people. Daniel 12, too. This was the great passage that got the Jewish people through the Maccabean revolt at Hanukkah. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake, those to, these to everlasting life, but others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. Resurrection was key. Back then, it is still key to Orthodox Judaism and Jewish theology today. The Amidah, the, one of the prayers, the set of prayers, a set of blessings that's recited Every day, multiple times in some instances, you are eternally mighty, Adonai. Second benediction, reviving the dead, that's resurrection. Abundantly able to redeem us. With kindness do you sustain the living and with great 
compassion do you relieve, do you revive the dead? Again, resurrection. You support the fallen, heal the sick, free the captives, and keep faith with those who sleep in the dust. You don't keep faith with decomposed corpses unless you have plans of resurrection. Who is like you, source of mighty deeds? Who is like you, O king, who causes death and restores life and causes deliverance to bring forth? In faithfulness, do you revive the dead? In case you miss the importance of resurrection and this prayer that is still recited every day today, blessed are you, Adonai, who revives the dead. Resurrection, the end of days, the last days. So she says, I know he'll, he'll, we all will rise. The end of time, the end of history as we know it. But Jesus doesn't say, good theology, well done, well said. No. He says to her one of the most important statements in the Gospel of John. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? To which Martha said, do you believe this? Do I believe this? Who should, who's going to believe something like this? No, no, no. Think about what Yeshua said. God will resurrect the dead. He has said on multiple occasions, I am the one whose voice the dead will hear. It's chapter 5, chapter 6. Go back and watch the, the video. The dead will hear my voice, but not only will I be the agent of the resurrection, I am the resurrection. And I am the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. In other words, when you die, doesn't matter, it's not the end for you. Because I am the resurrection. You will live again. And furthermore, the resurrection is found in 25. Life, eternal life, found in 26. Everyone who lives and believes puts their trust in me. If you commit your life to me, if you believe in me, you will never die. Not that you won't go through physical death. Of course, you will. of course you will. Unless, of course, the rapture occurs in your lifetime. But it certainly means that the moment that you believe, you have received life, eternal life. And so Yeshua is saying, I am both the agent of resurrection and the agent of eternal life. Do you believe this, he says to her? And I say to you, do you believe this? This is the crux of it. Christianity, messianic faith, is not a system, better system for living. Twelve steps on how to have a happier life. This is not a, a process, it's not a plan. It's an all-encompassing promise based upon whether or not the individual who makes the promise is trustworthy. And if he is, that means nothing can be the same. Yeshua is our resurrection. But the res we don't have to wait for death for resurrection. We have eternal life now. If we put our trust, if we put our faith, if we believe that he is who he says he is, if we believe that he is who he claims to be and what he claimed to do and what the New Testament claims that the Messiah has done, which is to live a perfect life. God coming down as man, living a perfect life and being executed, being sacrificed, if you will, 
on our behalf, receiving the just penalty for our rebellion against God. And because of his death and his shed blood, his sacrifice, that the penalty that was due us was placed on him. And he was buried in a tomb. And three days later he rose, never again to die, and therefore guaranteeing that what he promised before his death, burial and resurrection, will occur. You can take it to the bank, amen, amen, verily, verily, truly, truly. We can bet our very existences, our lives, that Jesus is who he says he is. Do you believe this? And what we have seen now is the fifth I am with a predicate. Yeshua is the bread of life. He is the light of the world. He is the door. He is the good shepherd. And he is both resurrection and life. These I am statements paint a powerful portrait. Connect those dots and put your trust in our Messiah. And if you've already put your trust in our Messiah, if you're already a believer in Yeshua, then double down. He is the trustworthy one. He is the one who is the resurrection and the life. And so she said to him, and we'll end here, yes, Lord, I have believed that you are Mashiach, you are the Christ. And by that I also mean Son of God. By that I also mean even he who comes into the world, the one who was sent from the Father, from the presence of the Father to the world. You are he. If you do not believe this, if you are not like Martha, Making this, and this is, by the way, this is the, I think, aside from Thomas at the end of the book, this is the greatest statement of faith that can be made by a woman. Don't miss the fact that the testimony of a woman here is given. Prominent place, right in the hinge of John. If you cannot stand and say, this is what you believe, then let's have a discussion. Let's talk. Because if you do not believe this, if you do not ascribe to these truths, if you have not accepted Yeshua as your Messiah, then as Yeshua has said, you will die in your sins. And we can't have that. We cannot have that. So talk to me. Talk to someone. Talk to the guys and gals who are going to be up here praying for you. Well, are we ever going to get to the tomb? Is anything going to happen with this uh, four-day-old dead body? I'm afraid for the time being I'm going to have to leave you in suspense. Mm -hmm.